I can't make any promises. Well, good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord. Will you stand and sing with us? Phil Wickham's House of the Lord. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be Shout out your praise. Oh, 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 we shout out your praise. The God who hears, we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. He's hung up on that cross. He rose up from that grave. My God still. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. We weren't the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. You came and broke them down. You broke them down. There were chains around us by your grace. 
Good morning. Go ahead and have a seat. My name is Casey, and I am so glad that you're here with us today, whether you are here in person or watching online. Thanks so much for joining us in worship. There's lots of new faces here, uh, and so I hope that there are new faces tuning in online as well. Some people I haven't seen in a while because you've been sick. I'm so glad to get to see you this morning. I uh, want to welcome you to our church. Uh, if there's anything that we can do for you, anything we can pray about, something we can serve you, if you have questions about our church, about how to get plugged in, or maybe you have questions about the Bible, or maybe you have questions about God, we'd love to connect with you. If you're here in person, make sure to reach out after church. We'd love to connect with you. If you're online, send us a message on Facebook. Uh, we want to connect with you and uh, serve you in any way that we can. I do want to share a passage of scripture with you from Romans chapter 8. It says this, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, then you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit 
of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, which means Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also may share in his glory. If we are followers of Christ, then we are joint heirs with him and our inheritance is great and we get to share in the glory of God, our Father. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we love you. And we are so grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us. Lord, that we could be joint heirs with your son, Jesus. Father, thank you for those who are here with us in person today and watching online. Lord, I pray that you would pour out a special blessing upon them this morning. Father, we open our hands and our hearts and invite you here. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word. Father, empower us through your Holy Spirit to be bold in our lives, in our communities, to reach others for you. Father, I pray that you would encourage us today through your word to um, bask in your Holy Spirit and the power that comes through him. We love you, Father, and we worship you this morning. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who died to save me With him for all eternity There will be a day when all will bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord I pray Prayed in desperation, the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear, and in the end we'll see that it was worth it to wipe away. shall be for him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the Lord and on that day Join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith with one voice a thousand generations singing worthy is the Lamb who was slain and on that day the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall Shout the hymn. 
thank you for singing with us and worshiping Christ Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. At this time, the young ones, you guys can be dismissed to Kids Church. Oh, Miss Emily. Well, it's such an encouragement to, to be here with everyone today. It's exciting to see a bunch of uh, visiting people, some, friends, some, some familiar faces, some new faces, but we're so excited that you're here. Uh, we've, I'm excited to get continue in our, our new series that we started last Sunday. We're talking through the book of Ephesians, through the first half of this book, where we're examining the riches that we have in Christ, in our position in Christ. And so this letter, which is written by the Apostle Paul, is this beautifully designed letter, okay? And it, it is profound and it is deep. It's, it's almost like one of Paul, it's like a ice theological masterpiece in many ways because it's only six chapters long. We can probably read it all the way through in about 20 minutes, but it is just chalked full of depth and wisdom. And this letter essentially actually it would sum up all of the, the, the beliefs, the convictions, the theology, and even the mission of the Apostle Paul himself. And so most of his letters, if you look at Paul's letters throughout the New Testament, he wrote most of the New Testament, by the way, but a lot of his letters, they are addressing a problem or there's something that is a need that he's trying to address within other churches. But Ephesians is unique and it is different because Ephesians is likely written to several churches in the region of Ephesus, okay? Because we know from Acts 19, we looked at this last week, Acts 19 tells us that in church history, Paul lived in Ephesus for at least two years where he had grown a successful ministry and many followers or many people became followers of Christ and it grew in not just one church but probably several churches. So this letter, it reads more like a summary statement of Paul's entire vision of this unique calling that Jesus gave him to announce the lordship and the reign of Jesus Christ. But for Paul, it was to announce it even beyond the Jewish world. So if you know, if, if you know about church history, what you'll know is that God used the apostle Paul to be his primary vessel to reach not just the Jewish community, but the Gentile world, which is anyone that is non-Jewish, which is probably most of us today, right? So it has extended beyond that. And so because of this, using Paul in this way, Christ was making a new covenant family that their identity was not just bound in their lineage. Their identity was not just bound in who their great, 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 great grandfather was, but now their identity is solely in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So this letter is all about how in Christ, there's a new family, there's a new covenant, he's making all things new, but it all rests on the reality that we are rich in the person of Christ. We have these blessings we receive from our union with Christ. So last week, for those who weren't able to be with us in person or online, last week we, we looked at the first 14 verses of this letter, and Paul opens with this a segment of excitement it's actually in the original language. In the English language, they put periods and, and breaks, but it was all one run-on sentence because it, he is so passionate. He opens with these spiritual blessings that we have in Jesus. So I want to review really quick. I should have it on the screens for us. Just those, we looked at six spiritual blessings that we have in our union with Christ, our position with Christ. Just a quick review. So the first thing we discovered in just the first 14 verses of this letter is that we have been chosen. God has chosen us. Before the creation of the world, we know that he has adopted us as sons and daughters. Remember, that's not second-rate adoption, meaning like we get the family name, but we don't really get all the family benefits. No, this is full-blown, embraced. You are entirely part of the family. You receive every familial benefit there is, that kind of adoption. He has redeemed us. Paul says it this way, that he lavished on us his grace. He poured out his mercy that we are smothered by his forgiveness. That's what it means to be lavished upon, right? We've learned the fourth thing that he's revealed to us, the mystery of his will. This is a tremendous blessing that those who profess their faith in Christ, that through the work of the Holy Spirit, spend the rest of our life discovering and learning the will of our Father. He's revealed that to us, that he's even given us, he's revealed what will happen in the end when Christ returns to reclaim it all for himself. 
The fifth thing that we looked at is that he has given us an inheritance. Casey read from Romans chapter 8, and, this, and Paul alludes to it in that, in that book as well. This inheritance is not just um, as brothers and sisters, as sons and daughters, if you, play, if you profess Christ. We are joint heirs of the kingdom of God, but we're also co-heirs. And we're co-heirs with none other than the person of Jesus himself. So through the work of Christ, God sees those who have given their life and because of that work in Christ to Christ. He sees us as he sees his son, Jesus. That we have that inheritance. And the, the sixth thing is that we receive the seal of the Holy Spirit as this deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So it's kind of like earnest money. It's kind of like a proof of purchase that this validates ownership of who we belong to now. And we get all of that. And the Holy Spirit is alive and actively working. So Paul, typically in his letters, he opens with a greeting. He, he, he qualifies himself as an apostle. And then he goes into a prayer of thanksgiving over the people he's writing the letter to. But Ephesians is slightly different in that he, op- he introduces himself as an apostle and, and, and qualifies his apostleship. But he goes straight into these statements of praise, praising God for the blessings that we have in our, our position in Christ. But now, the verses we're going to look at today, he transitions later, which is not normally how he does it, but he transitions to this prayer based on those blessings for the people in the Ephesus region, okay? So we're going to look at verse 15 through 23 today of Ephesians chapter 1. Let's read the entirety of the teaching text, and then we'll break it down verse by verse. So verse 15, coming off the heels of all that passionate teaching and praise for God in Christ, he says this, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, Remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet, and he appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for us gathering together today. Lord, it's the spirit of, of worship in here. The spirit is, is amongst us, and we're so grateful for that. We're thankful that, that you are present. Lord, I pray that as we unpack your word in Ephesians chapter 1, God, that you will give us the spirit of wisdom in the same way that Paul prays this for the, the, the believers in Ephesus. Lord, that we will have the spirit of wisdom, that the spirit of truth will speak and open our minds to receive the truth of your word. Lord, if there's anyone listening in this room or watching online that maybe they don't have a relationship with the person of Jesus, maybe they've never given their lives to Christ, Lord, I pray that today that your spirit just use the message that you have laid on my heart through the power of the spirit to just speak truth. Lord, help us all to have ears to, to hear it and eyes to see that we'll have a mind that will be open and a heart that will be open to listen. So God, again, we thank you and we trust you. It's in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so again, he opens with this passionate expression of praise because of our position in Christ, because of the blessings and the riches we have in Christ. And now he transitions based on that to provide a prayer. He reveals to the believers in the Ephesus in the region of Ephesus how he's been praying for them. And why he's been praying for them. So let's break it down verse by verse. Starting in verse 15 and 16. Look what Paul says. For this reason, again, coming off of that passionate statement of praise. Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So if you remember what we said last week, what we learned last week is that Paul is writing this letter in chains. He's in prison. Okay. And so this is several years removed from when he was physically present in the region of Ephesus, and he is now imprisoned by Roman imprisonment. 
but he is writing this letter. So imagine Paul, he is, he, is, he is increasing in years. He's had years of fruitful ministry, part of which is in the region of Ephesus amongst many believers. And as he's in prison, he's hearing encouraging reports. He's hearing encouraging news about what God is doing through these people and through these churches. He's excited. He's encouraged. And he says, for this reason, talking about the blessings we have in Christ, he expresses he hasn't stopped thanking God and his praying over them because of what he's hearing. But I want you to notice what he is, what delights Paul about the, the believers in Ephesus. He doesn't suggest that I praise God because of how beautiful I hear your church building is. He doesn't say, I praise God because I hear that you have really great programs in ministry. I praise God because I hear about this incredibly large offering and tithe that your church has been contributing to. The, like, all those are blessings, aren't bad things, so those are all blessings. But notice, there's just two simple things that Paul points out that launches him into this prayer of thanksgiving over these people. Two simple things. It is their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and their love for all the saints. That's it. And this very concise statement of just kind of just sharing with them what he's been praying and why he's thankful, I think Paul actually offers the two ingredients of a healthy church. All the other things I was kind of being facetious about, those are blessings. Those aren't bad to have a build. What a gift to have a building to gather together. There's a lot of churches around the world who don't have the blessing of a building. What a gift it is to have people to do programs to reach more people. Those are all blessings. But really at the heart of a healthy church are these two ingredients. It's to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to love his people. That's what it is. Remember, Jesus said several times to his disciples, the world will know you are my disciples by how? Your love for one another, right? And so faith in Christ is not just I trust him with my eternal destiny, but I also trust him in the present moment as well. That means his teaching, his words have weight in my life as an individual, but also as an individual of his church. That's what these people were doing. Second thing is they were loving the saints, loving his people. We, we looked at the saint, what the word saint means last week. It means set apart. It's a believer in Christ. It means set apart. Well, who are we set apart for? We are set apart for God. What are we set apart for? We are set apart to reflect his holiness. As broken people who can't be holy, we can't do that apart from the person of Jesus. And so having just expressed all this incredible praise stuff over our position in Christ, he says, you love the saints. You are set apart for God, and you are set apart to reflect his holiness. And now, because of what Christ has done, we actually can reflect the holiness of God because of the holiness of Jesus over our lives. Okay? So these are simple, but these are the key ingredients of a healthy church. So we can express faith in Jesus, but if we have disdain towards other brothers and sisters, we're not healthy. Not just brothers and sisters in this building, but brothers and sisters who represent other, other, other local bodies of God's church too. Like, we have to have an accord, unity in the body of Christ. That is the, the ingredients of a healthy church. So he is so excited about their faith. He's encouraged. He's in chains writing this letter, but he's passionate. He's encouraged by their faith and encouraged by their love for one another. And he continues now to reveal to them how he specifically has been praying over them. And before we jump into those verses... Um, it makes me think of some moments in my life where I think I prayed, I, I have prayed several times in my life boldly, and there's been moments I've prayed um, heartfelt and fervently, but also audacious prayer. And I think of the times I've had children. Um, so today is my oldest son's 13th birthday, okay? <clears throat> I feel so old today, all right? Um, you know, I remember... Every time, when all of our kids had, had been born, um, everyone tells you, hey, it's going to go by quick. You know, it's like, oh, I know, I know. And then you realize, oh, it's true. <laughs> like, you look back, and it's ha it happens so fast, right? And I, I tease my kids every time they turn another year. I say, hey, you know, last year when he was turning 12, I say, hey, if you turn 12, you're grounded for life. You know, just kind of joke. If you turn 13, you're going to be grounded for life. I'm always just teasing. My point is, I want time to slow down, right? We, we all kind of want that. But I remember... I remember holding my son, and this happened with every one of my boys. But God, God is so, so kind and gracious to, to bless us with children. And, and I remember holding him for the first time. And many things fill your mind. And for those who've had the blessing of being able to, to experience this, I think you know what I'm talking about. And um, 
And one of the things I realized I was stunned by is I was surprised at, I didn't know I had the capacity to love an individual so quickly, so deeply. I just didn't know. You knew you were going to love the kid, but then it's like, oh, man, I didn't know I could love the kid like that. And it happened every time. It wasn't just with the oldest, by the way. It was with all of them. Okay, I'm not saying he's, he's the only one we love. No, that's not true at all. It happened every time. But I remember, I remember this. I remember when he would come home, he came home, and this happened all, all four times, when the first week they're home and you're just, you know, you're looking at them and you're holding them, you're rocking them. You're, I remember praying. And that might be, and I don't know if this is, this is a, just being honest with you, this might be the, the moments in my life I prayed the most audacious prayers and maybe, and maybe that's not a good thing, that that's the only time I can think that I pray probably the deepest, most passionate, fervent prayers in my life. I was praying over my kids. And, um, and it wasn't just a prayer of, Lord, just bless them, give them a comfortable life. It's not that, honestly. I think in those moments, maybe by the, by the Holy Spirit and his grace, you see things so more, much more clearly. At least I, I got to experience that where I felt like, I want to pray for the deeper things. I want to pray more than just give them the best comfortable life because no one wants to see their kids suffer, okay? But I began to pray when they were a week old, God shaped their heart, their little heart, that when the Holy Spirit works in you, works in them, they will come to a saving faith, the faith that Paul's talking about here. And it's, maybe it's the fervent prayers of a father, I don't know, but it's that kind of spirit of prayer that God's people need to be engaged in, not just in those moments in time, but any time we lift others up in prayer. In fact, I would even say, if you ever struggle with how to pray for other people outside of just their heart, their, their felt needs, because oftentimes, like, we have, it's a broken world, and we all have experience, we experience broken things. So we have broken circumstances, broken relationships, and sometimes that's the, all we know to pray for. But I, what Paul's about to show us and, and teach us here is there are things that are much deeper that we all need to be praying for over each other. Much deeper than even the experiences that we're going through right now. Much deeper than even the challenges we're experiencing right now. There are things that are eternal things, whereas the felt needs are temporary things. And I think Paul, while he's in prison, as a prisoner, has this perspective of eternality that I think we all can learn from in how we pray for each other. So if you ever want to learn how to pray for yourself, pray for your family, your marriage, for your church, and for the city of Columbia, let's look at the model that Paul provides for us, and myself included, okay? So look at how he reveals how he's been praying for these believers, starting in verse 17. He just said, remembering you my prayers, I give thanks. And then in verse 17 he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. It's very succinct, it's very compact, but it is deeply profound. He begins asking the Father to grant these believers the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God better. And I think what Paul is painting here, he's demonstrating that us as human beings and the believers then as well, we don't have the capacity to know God on that level unaided, meaning without his help. Like humanity doesn't have the power to know God in that way on our own human intellect. So we need the spirit of truth, the spirit of wisdom to cultivate that within us. And Paul's praying that they will know him better. So the result of the Father and the Spirit giving this kind of understanding to the point that he prays that their, the eyes of their heart will be enlightened. But what does he mean? Coming off the heels of what he's been expressing in our position, our riches in Christ, I think what he means is that he wants them to, under, to grasp in a profound way the wonder of what God has done for them. Like to grasp in a deep way the wonder of what God has done for them and what he's done for us. And again, just those six things we reviewed a second ago. The fact that he's chosen us before he ever, we, ever, he ever, we ever existed. Remember, God operates outside of time. We're bound by time. So he knew us before we ever existed. He chose us. 
He adopts us as sons and daughters. Not second-rate adoption, but deeply in, 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 ingrained into the family. We are, has, have his name and we have the benefits of, of God's family. That he's redeemed us. He's lavished his grace on us. We are smothered by his forgiveness. He reveals his will to us. He's given us an inheritance. And he's blessed us with the living, active Holy Spirit from the moment we pl- place our faith in him until we get to meet him one day in eternity. So the wonder of what he has done for them, okay? And so with that, he asked the spirit of, of wisdom, the spirit of truth to reveal to them, enlighten the, the eyes of their heart to three things that I think are eternal things. They're not circumstantial things. Remember, Paul is in prison writing this. Talk about bad circumstances. Most of the letters he wrote were from prison, He was always in bad circumstances. He was always facing bad situations. But he always just, the praise of what God has done and the eternal hope oozes out of this man. Okay? So the first thing he says, I pray that your eyes will be enlightened to the hope of his calling. Second, that you'll know the greatness of of God's glorious inheritance. And third, God's incomparably great power given to those who believe. So as believers, as sons and daughters, if you've placed your faith in Christ, Let's examine how this can be, what this can mean for us as well. Number one, the hope of his calling, to know the hope of his calling. Paul prays that these believers would grasp the hope to which they were called, and we need to pray that we will grasp the hope to, the hope to which we were called. So this calling refers to God's effective summoning to have faith in, his, in, in the gospel, to have faith in his son Jesus. It's the effective summons to this faith. It's not ineffective. It's deeply effective, and it's powerful. When the Spirit begins to work in the heart of an individual, he is calling him closer to himself, drawing us closer to him. It's this summoning, and it's powerful, and it's effective. It's just as powerful as when God says, let there be light in a place that only knew darkness. That's how powerful it is. It's that kind of effective draw through this work of the Spirit to have faith in the work of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. This is Paul writing as well. He uses similar language, even using that analogy. He says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. To know the hope of his calling is to know that it's light in a dark, dark place. That's what it means. We have a hopeful calling. It's not a calling of despair. It's not a calling to faith of of bitterness or of anger. It's one of hope. So the hope that believers await is this sure confidence that our Heavenly Father sees us the same way he sees Jesus. I still can't fathom that. Because to know the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus and the ministry of Jesus and the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, it's perfection. It's a life that none of us could ever live. And it's submission to the Father none of us could ever fulfill. But yet, because of that work and because of his saving grace, like he actually sees us the same way he sees his son. That's hope. And that's not circumstantial hope, by the way. That's not temporary. That's actually eternal. Because it transcends our timeline, and we get to experience that and benefit from that for all eternity. And so... We are purified from sin, being shaped into the image of who we were created to be. So that means even in our worst days, even through our most challenging seasons, and even in our darkest moments, we have a hope that he has called us to. And I got to tell you, I'm guilty of this myself, um, because I'm I'm also broken, flawed, and imperfect. Um, It's a confusing message to an unbelieving world when someone proclaims faith in Christ, but their life and their attitude is constantly bitter because of their life circumstances. They're angry because of what's happened to them, or they're in despair all the time, but yet we claim to have a hopeful message. That's a confusing message, right? Because this is not based on making our temporary time here greater. That means simply this this blessing alone that he's praying that they'll understand is really, it's sufficient for anyone to walk through life, even the worst experiences for the rest of our time here because this hope goes beyond this time here it's do we know the hope of our calling and I got to say if if God's church if the people us making up part of his church part of the body of Christ if we just actively live hopeful lives 
that's a really compelling message to send because it's not a hopeful world. So if God's people don't make, we claim hope but don't actively live hope, it's confusing. And Paul's saying, I just pray that you know the hope that, of your calling. It's pretty incredible. Let's pray that for ourselves and let's pray that for others as well. Second thing is this, that they would know the greatness of God's glorious inheritance. Now, it's interesting how Paul words this here in verse 18, because he says the riches of his glorious inheritance is in his holy people. Paul opened the letter expressing how wealthy we are because of our inheritance to Christ. But now here, he seems to be, he seems to be showing that it's, this isn't our inheritance, but it's God's inheritance. So what could he mean when he's talking about God's inheritance? See, Paul is saying that we should pray to the point that we understand that God's inheritance is his people. This text says that God's inheritance are the saints, are the sons and daughters, are his people that he has brought into his family and adopted into his family through our faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So Paul is revealing an incredibly beautiful reality here. And he's revealing that God delights in, he prizes, and he loves those who belong to him. Like, understand, God's people, sons, his sons and daughters, are not a burden to him. But we are delighted in. We are prized. We are loved by our heavenly Father. So God's inheritance is his people, and he delights in that. Paul is praying that these believers will know how greatly loved they are by God, who is their heavenly Father. And for some of us who have maybe, unfortunately, not so great earthly father experiences, it's not perfect because none of us are perfect, including our dads, right? And it's so hard to associate a heavenly father when if our earthly father experience is not a good one. But remember, this is perfection. So he is perfectly good which means he's perfectly loving and merciful and kind and forgiving all those things that none of us can attain or none of us can, 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 can reach in our own effort, right? So this is a father who doesn't see us as a burden. This is a father who doesn't abandon. This is a father who doesn't abuse. This is a father who keeps his promises. This is a father who doesn't make mistakes. And so when he's saying, I hope that you know the greatness of God's inheritance, he sees us as his sons and daughters, as his people, as an inheritance. Isn't that incredible? Like just those two things alone so far, that we will know the hope of his calling and that we will know that we are his inheritance. So we inherit the blessings of Jesus Christ by receiving salvation, but the Father inherits his saints and his adopted sons and daughters through him giving salvation beautiful. And then Paul goes to the third thing, and we'll spend some time here, that they will know the incomparably great power that he has given to those who believe. So Paul offers this prayer. It's a prayer of power for the followers in the region of Ephesus, and he wants those believers, and I think just like us today as believers, that we have this resource of power that's apparently available to us if we have eyes to see and understand what he's referring to. So what kind of power could Paul be talking about here? What kind of power does God just readily give to those who believe? Well, in our context today, depending on how we understand power, it can have a negative connotation with it. And what I mean by that is, in our context, we often think of the abuse of power, someone in a power position, right? So we think of maybe the abuse of power with scandals that you can read on the internet or watch in the news or we think of the abuse of power in relationships, whether it be family relationships or friendships, whatever it might be. Maybe it's the abuse of power within, you know, politics or whatever, we, you know, within the political positioning. We experience that a lot. And so this negative association with this understanding of a person of power, it's this belief that, and it's based on, on you know, real events, it's based on real experiences, but it's this idea that so-and-so and so-and-so can do whatever they want and get away with it. And sometimes it happens. And there's a sense of injustice and this frustration. So because of that, we are typically, understandably even, we are suspicious of a person in power when we think of it that way. But in the context of the believers in the region of Ephesus, what we know from history is that, remember, Ephesus was a large city, and it was known for its commerce. 
but also it was known for its pagan worship. It was an epicenter for worship of the Greek and Roman gods. And so they were heavily influenced by, by mystical power, by magical power, by the occult power. And so their understanding of power, if Paul were to just say that you will know the incomparable power that God wants to give to all those who believe and just left it at that, it could be a confusing message because of their association with the mystics that was happening at that point in church history. So Paul quickly, immediately with the next statement, he qualifies what this power is. And I want us to examine specifically what kind of power is it that God gives to those who believe. Look at verse 19 again through 21. They will know his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. So this kind of power that Paul is referring to, that Paul is talking about, this resurrection power, it's available to those believers 2,000 years ago. It's available to the believers today. It's the power that transformed a dead Jesus of Nazareth into a resurrected Jesus of Nazareth. It's that power. And so when you read in Paul's letters, he uses terms like this present age or, or the age that is right now, or he talks about the world or this age of sin. He is referring to the good, the good world that God has made. But he doesn't leave it at that. He understands that this present age is the good world that God has made, but his good world has been deeply compromised. It's been compromised and fractured by human sin and human selfishness. And that reality results in a world of death. And it looks a lot like our world. It is our world, right? And this is the age that we live in. We live in the age of sin. We live in the age of death. We live in the present age that has been ushered in because of our own human choices to go our own way versus the good creator's way. There are consequences, and we experience it every day. However, Paul often refers to in his, in his writings, there's another part, there's another term he uses, and it's the age to come. It's this future. It's this kingdom. And it's as if in this, this right here, we, we understand it's like the, the future, the age to come, comes crashing into the present age, and, he, and it did so in the person of Jesus. It's as if in Jesus, God has come amongst us as the one human being that has not been compromised by sin. He does not give in to the impulses that we give into every single day in our fallen nature, but he actually lives as the kind of human being that God intended, always intended human beings to actually be. And he lives on our behalf, but he died on our behalf. And so Jesus absorbs the collective mess and the result of all of our selfishness. He absorbed the collective mess and the results of all of our brokenness. He absorbed the collective mess and the results of all of our sinfulness. He absorbs death, the curse of sin, into himself on the cross. And so the resurrection of Jesus is this moment where right here in the midst of our broken world, we see what the power of God is all about. And it's actually not the kind of power that God could have put on display. God could have said, I'm God, I can do whatever I want. And he can. But the kind of power that he reveals to us, the kind of power that he offers to us, to those who believe, is a different power. It's a power that gives up status. It's a power that puts aside divine authority to absorb and take the hit on behalf of others, allowing the sins of all the world to absolutely crush him. That's the kind of power he puts on display. But because of his commitment to his inheritance, because of his commitment to his sons and daughters, it, it's so strong. Because of his commitment and his love and his mercy for sinful humans, because it was so strong, he displays the power to reverse death into life. So the very curse of sin, he reverses it. And it can only be done through God. And he did it through the person of Jesus. That's exactly what the resurrection of Jesus is all about. In the resurrection, 
God's power is power to take the most tragic, sinful, and selfish human beings. And then they encounter Jesus, turn them into something that is life-giving. And it's a concept that is so overwhelming and humbling at the same time. So physical death, it's our enemy. (laughs) Physical death is a tragedy, but physical death does not have the last word. And it is because Jesus rose from the dead. And whatever power God exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead, that same power will manifest itself somehow for all who believe in the age to come. When Christ returns and reclaims it for himself, that resurrection power will manifest itself for all those who believe. But when you study Paul's writings, he doesn't just leave it there. There's another aspect of this resurrection power that affects the age that is now. It affects the age that is present. See, God has the power to actually change us right here, right now. See, the state of our present life, or the the present state of our life, the present state of our character does not get to determine the meaning or the value of our life because of God's ability to change us right here in the age that is right now. These believers, he prays, Paul prays that they will have faith to entertain the reality that God has the power to reverse the decaying moments. He has the power to reverse the sinful moments. He has the power to reverse the the moments that are the direct consequences of our broken nature, and he turns them into something new. He is making all things new. So this kind of power that Paul is referring to here, it heals and it transforms sinful human beings. Isn't that incredible? It's not just something that's going to happen in the age to come, but he's doing it right now. For some of us, if we were to share our testimonies and, re- and reveal who we were before Christ, but over this, the, the constant work of his spirit in us and reflect and see, that's not who I am anymore. Because of his resurrection work to reverse death into life is working right now in the present age, and it will come to fruition in the age to come when we all get to experience that resurrection power. So when believers gather together in hope and we understand the privilege of being considered among the people that God calls his precious inheritance, it's a hope that he can actually reverse the power of sin and death in our lives. Not just in the age to come, but in the age that is right now. So Paul makes it very evident that through this prayer he's praying on behalf of these believers in Ephesus and on behalf of the believers around the world today, that we will come to know the extraordinary power of God. It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead and placed him at the right hand of God in the heavenly realms, ruling with all authority and power and dominion. Amen. And he continues in wrapping up these last few verses of this chapter. He continues talking about our position in Christ, but now Christ as the authority over us in his church. Look at verse 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So God has placed all things under the feet of Christ, and he's appointed him to be head over everything. That is an important theological point because if we were to revisit the opening chapters of Genesis, what we'll find out is that when God created everything, he created it and gave it all all authority, all dominion, all rule over the earth. He gave it to humanity. That was a gift. That was a blessing. Adam and Eve, the first humans represented in Scripture, were to exercise as God's governing representatives. That's what we were meant to do. However, the decision to choose their own way instead of the good creator way, good creator's way, changed things. And now human beings, all of us, have sinned, all of us. But this promised rule over it all was still promised to human beings who are now the sinful ones, right? But by God's grace, this promise has still been fulfilled in the person of Jesus who was the sinless one. And so now everything is subjected to him. And he rules at God's right hand. He is now the head, which means he is ruler and authority over the church. So the church is Christ's body, and the church is filled with the fullness of Christ because of his redeeming work that he has lavished on us, right? 
So since the church belongs to Christ and he is the head of the church, that means this. That means Christ, it means that Christ's victory is the church's victory. That means Christ's power is the church's power. That means Christ's triumph is the church's triumph. So just as Christ triumphed over death, declaring victory, the church will triumph over the curse of death, declaring victory in Jesus. It's incredible. We are one chapter in, a very short book, and already we've learned our position in Christ and the riches that come with that. And continuing that thought, Paul specifically praised three things, three categories over these people that are all founded on the reality of those blessings in our position in Christ. So may we be people as individuals who collectively make up his church, be a people that praise God in the position we have in Jesus and the riches that we have in Jesus. May we be people that have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a love for all the saints. May we be people who, through the power of the Holy Spirit, enlighten our hearts to know the hope of his calling. That we'll be hopeful people, not bitter people, not angry people. We have been redeemed by the saving work of Jesus. There's no room for bitterness in a heart that's been redeemed. To know the hope of his calling, that we will know the greatness of his glorious inheritance, which is his people. We are not a burden. He delights in his people. He delights in his sons and daughters. And the third thing, that we will know the incomparable power that has been given to us to those who believe. So in closing, and to repeat this, he says, the kind of power is the power to heal and transform sinful human beings like ourselves. That when believers gather together in hope, it's not a hope that is, that's unfounded, but it is a hope that he has the power to actually reverse the power of sin and death in our lives, not just in this age, not in just the age to come, but in this age presently as well. And so I hope that you're encouraged. I hope that you're challenged. When we pray for each other, let's pray for the burdens that we, that we are all walking through in life, but may we pray deeper for things that are eternal things. May we pray this over ourselves, over our marriages, over our family, over our church, over our city, that we will come to know the hope of his calling, that we'll come to know the greatness of his inheritance, that we'll come to know the power that he exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead is the same resurrection power he's working in us right now. Let that motivate us to live on mission as we carry his hope wherever we go. I'm gonna invite Kyle up. If you will begin to just play some, some music behind and we're gonna pray. Um, and then we're gonna close with a song. But I just encourage you, as uh, the band prepares this final song of worship before we close, maybe you're watching online or you're here today and you've never professed faith in Christ. You're hearing all these things and maybe, they, 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 maybe it's confusing, maybe you're, you have some questions or maybe it sounds great but you don't know where to start. I just want to encourage you, none of us are perfect. Even the one in this room who's been a believer the longest is not perfect and it's only in the person of Jesus that we have hope at all but it's a wonderful hope and it's eternal and it's real and it's based on the work of the cross and the work of the resurrection. So I encourage you, if that's you and you have questions or you need prayer, please take this opportunity to reflect on this truth, but come find myself or one of the leaders in this, in this church. We'd love to encourage you and pray with you and help you on the next steps of your walk with Jesus. If you're watching online and the same thing, please message us. We would love to reach out to you and encourage you on uh, making choices and decisions in your next steps uh, in your walk with Jesus. So let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that you um, love us so deeply. God, that when we read this kind of passage in scripture, or some of us, we just feel unforgivable. Some of us, we feel like our past is just too messy. And to even ask to be in your family just feels like a burden. And Lord, your word tells us that is a lie from the enemy. Your word tells us that we're not a burden. We're all broken. We all need grace. But through your son, Jesus, and through our faith in Jesus, your word tells us that you delight in us as an inheritance, as something that you value and you treasure. 
God, we thank you for that truth. Thank you for the hope that you've called us to, this, this effective summoning to have faith in the gospel. Lord, we thank you for this work, this power that raised Christ from the dead and that is raising us to be new and made new and have new life. I pray that you will work in our hearts, that the Spirit will work. And Lord, if there's anyone that just has questions or they want to make a decision to follow you, God, that you will be with them and they will understand the beauty of making the decision to profess their faith in Jesus. God, we thank you again. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to close with one more song of worship.
Thank you so much for being here. I'm so encouraged. I hope you are today, too. I want to close real quick in prayer. I know there's a lot of things going on right now. Some people are battling some things and sicknesses and running some tests, trying to figure out what's going on. But let's lift each other up in prayer as we dismiss. Um, let's also be in the habit. Maybe this week, let's just all find at least one day we can pray this model over maybe ourselves, our family, our church, or maybe there's a relationship, someone that you care deeply about. Just start praying these kinds of things over them, um, that God will give them the spirit of wisdom to have their eyes open to these three, these three realities of what we have in Christ, okay? So let's pray for one another. I know uh, let's pray for, for the things that are happening and the challenges in our families as well. So God, we thank you. We pray again that you will bless our, our week. So I, I do lift up the needs that we are experiencing. Um, God, you know the burdens that each family represented are walking through. I pray that you will encourage them, remind them of the hope of their calling, remind them that we are your, your, your sons and daughters, you delight in us, and remind us of the power you've given us through the resurrection of Jesus, even if the circumstances we pray about don't change. Remind us of that. Lord, I do lift up those who are, um, doctors are trying to figure out different things within uh, different situations. I pray for even, I think of Phil's father who is, um, has a tumor and has operation happening this week. I just pray that you will bless the doctors there, give them wisdom and insight. And Lord, all their other needs like that, that you can go before us and you know what's going to take place. We just trust you. Help us to be people of hope this week. Give us opportunities to share the gospel. Give us opportunities to be an encouragement and to, to live as hope-filled people today and tomorrow and the rest of this week. God, we thank you again. It's in Christ's name. Amen. You can be dismissed. Thank you so much for being here.